are you, I think you might be muted, Laura, if you're trying to talk to me. Oh my God, I was too. And I was making funny sound effects. So that is, uh, <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh my gosh, is my speaker not working? What's going on? Oh, so can you hear me? Does it sound good? Yeah. Let me do a sound check on you. So can you say three, two, one or something? Check, check, three, two, one. How do awesome. I sound? Um, you sound okay. good. Well, I am your host and chief data scientist at Microsoft. I have the amazing pleasure today to introduce to you Amanda Rosemark. So Amanda used to be on my very first team at Microsoft and was one of the joys um, that I had in one of the first offsites we did when we actually got to do things in, per in public because she and I were both avoiding the same sort of oddball at that moment in time. And so I'm not going to say anything else, but I knew right away I had a kindred sister. So Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Absolutely. So tell me a bit about how you came to be at Microsoft and what you're doing right now. Um, you want to go all the way back to the beginning? I do. Okay. Um, so I think my journey like into technology is actually pretty like unexciting and straightforward. I, I loved math and like the physical sciences growing up and my dad loved technology. So he was always bringing new things into the house before we like even knew what they were. And so um, it was pretty natural when I was going to go to university to settle on engineering and I loved it. And um, so I studied electrical engineering okay. and I ended up, yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of hard work, but it's good. Um, and I ended up going after undergrad to IBM. I was there for like eight years doing hardware development on game consoles. So I got to work on the Wii, the PlayStation, the Xbox, um, a whole host of those along with some of the IBM servers. And it was great. I got exposure to like tons of super talented people. I got to see the whole development process. Um, but eventually I kind of realized, you know, I, I, love, I love seeing this development process, but I'm totally detached from our customers mm. and from a lot of the like business decisions that are happening. Right. And I, I felt incomplete. And so I knew I had always wanted to go back to grad school. And so I had looked at a few different options. I looked at studying more engineering. I had looked at um, intellectual property law, actually. And oh, really? um, oh, yeah, I, interesting. <laughs> um, I ended up not liking the idea of it, but I had talked to several IP lawyers just because I was like, well, this could be neat. Um, and then I actually looked at business and I, that's where I settled. I went toward the MBA um, it felt like a good blend of getting that like business knowledge mm -hmm. paired up with my engineering and tech experience. Mm -hmm. um, and the great thing is I landed at the Tepper School of Business, which is at Carnegie Mellon. So it was like a business program that was deep into technology and science. And it was just perfect for me. Um, but it gave me this two years to really think about what's kind of next in my career? What are the opportunities out there that I just didn't really even know about before? Yeah. Um, and I had never in my life considered working in sales, <laughs> but I ended up talking to a couple of alumni who were working for Microsoft in technology, technical sales. And I was like, wow, this sounds like perfect. I love it. I never would have considered it, but, but let's go for it. Um, and fortunately I was offered a position um, which is actually totally different than the one I'm in um, because I needed to change geographies and that role was not available there. Um, and, but there was some of these cloud solution architect roles, which is pretty new at the time. Yeah. And um, so I met with the CSA hiring manager and he was talking about the role and what they do. And he's like, so, I mean, does this sound interesting to you? And I'm, I'm telling him, yes, this sounds fascinating. I would love this role. Mm -hmm. But thinking to myself, um, I mean, I know Azure is a platform, but that's about it. <laughs> and this is why I love you, because it was in my interview with Tom that and we laughed to this day where I said, Azure is a color. After he said, what do I think of Azure? And I'm like, it's a color. And he thought I was joking. And yeah. I remember months <laughs> later going, you know, I really wasn't joking when I asked. I didn't do the best preparation. Um, I thought I was coming in for a data science thing, not a cloud gig. And so it's well, funny yeah, that you I was, that. Like, I thought I was talking more about like general sales and, and more of a less technical role because mm. that's what most of my MBA peers were applying for. Right. And, and yeah, I was like, I mean, I knew 
I knew it was a cloud platform, but I had no background in IT, no background in software development, no background in like pure data science like you. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there thinking like, I mean, this sounds awesome, but you know, I'm like super ill qualified. <laughs> um, I don't know about but, that, but. <laughs> but you know, that's what's going yeah. through my head. Of course. And um, fortunately he took a chance on me. And so that's how I ended up at Microsoft in the cloud solution architect role. Um, and so I, I did not know you were an, you had an electrical engineering background. So I want to yeah. first say that's amazing. First of all, I, <laughs> you know, that it makes you even this like additional, like boss lady that I didn't know. So that's why I love these interviews because you end up finding out nuggets like that. Yeah. So that, that was amazing. Second, that you worked on gaming consoles. Like how cool mm -hmm. is that? Like, what did you actually, were you in like a fab, I think it's called a fab lab or, you know, where you, you work on chipsets or what part of the hardware were you working on? So we were just, we were doing CPU design. Okay. Um, and then eventually some GPU design as well. So we were not actually part of the fabrication process. We were okay. well before that. Um, it, you know, it's basically like two years of planning before you would actually get to the point of fabricating silicone. Okay. Um, silicon, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I did a whole bunch of things. I, I actually started as an applications engineer because there were about 75 different tools that we needed for the entire process. So I got had to learn all of those tools and really help troubleshoot them when things were going Home wrong. Grown tools or tools that you could buy off the shelf today? A couple of them. I mean, some of them were off the shelves. Some of the some of them were off the shelf with things built on top. Okay. And some of them were homegrown. So um, and you had and to some learn of them this all like, from scratch. Like you had to just get in there and figure out how to make all this work. Yeah, it was basically like people come to you with problems and you're trying to figure it out kind of alongside them. Um, you know, I wasn't the only person in the role. So we had a great team of people who kind of found their niche in certain, certain tooling and stuff, but there were definitely some of them that were built 20, 30 years ago and still um, oh, time <laughs> being tools. utilized and, you know, cobbled together. So you're like trying to find patches for things and figure out how they can work. But um, so that's kind of where I started. And then I got into some of our timing and our verification, um, which gave me a, a great view of the whole life cycle. Were you the only, um, or, or tell me a bit about coming into a tech dominated world that's typically dominated by male. Um, were there a lot of females on the team? Were they already exploring diversity, you know, there, or was it where you were that voice? Because when I look at you, just like similar to when people meet me, I met Chris Halberg going to the Britney Spears concert in all of my glitter and hair. And it's like, hi, I'm your data scientist. And I remember his face was like, <laughs> <laughs> like Tom really <laughs> she, yeah and, like there's a perception that if you look one way and I call it the L Wood syndrome you can't possibly be in a, in a role like a math role or a STEM role and so did mm -hmm. you did you experience any of that coming into the world that you were in oh absolutely um I mean when fortunately I was working for a bigger company they had a huge diversity effort but I was also working in hardware, which is like even more male dominated than a lot of like other tech right. fields. And so there were other women, but there were not a lot. Um, and we actually ended up forming sort of our own um, support group, I guess you would call oh, nice. it, where we we tried to meet regularly just to to talk about things. You know, unfortunately, like I don't have each other. Yeah, exactly. Just to talk about, okay, how are things going? I mean, it wasn't anything like dramatic or traumatic, but just but to just be to there be for one another and like feel like those 30 other meetings where you were the only woman in the room, mm. it is not the all the time scenario. No, that, and when you were going, so that's amazing actually that they actually had such a big DNI, you know, uh, sort of support back then. And funny, I've interviewed others that, that work there currently. And they said, they've said the same thing that, mm -hmm. you know, they were one of the early ones that really believed in, you know, just having females, but still very underrepresented in comparison, just because that's the reality of there weren't a lot of candidates that were women graduating going and definitely not I want to go to hardware at the time and what's funny <laughs> inter like interviewing people is largely that they thought they couldn't so mm -hmm. how did you it, it sounds like maybe your family had an impact on your decision to go into engineering or was that all Amanda's decision the the decision to go into engineering was I I would say was all mine but I okay. think that like initial kernel of interest in technology certainly came from my dad you know I mean he made me start buying DVDs when all I wanted to buy was a tape deck and like, you know, got a computer into our house a little earlier than most of my friends. And so I think just having 
and exposure mm -hmm. to some of that stuff was was probably what at least sparked my interest and then it's like okay well I like math I like science mm -hmm. let's try this thing no I mean I think parental support is uh, I mean obviously it seems like yeah a no-brainer but what's funny is I've chatted with people whose parents are literally like you're a woman you can't go into engineering even today and you know it's like the compassion I feel now you know my mom set a really strong example for me as a CPA and a single mom going to school at night to make sort of this world be better and then became this powerful powerhouse of a CPA, you know, after she graduated, but it, it's it instilled the work ethic into me. And so when I've talked to folks who have parents who unfortunately didn't support them or didn't set that, you know, I feel very blessed. And so it sounds like your dad was at least the kernel starter for you. Um, do you, do, have you ever just come back to him and said like, Hey, thanks dad. Like, you know, I'm on this journey now and here I am at Microsoft, you know, from something. Oh yeah, like definitely. Started. I think I've used, uh, I've used him and his story to sort of talk about like, you know, on college applications, why do I want to be an engineer? So, oh, no, I love um, that. <laughs> yeah, he definitely talked about it. But yeah, no, I agree with you. I think having that support system, I mean, it's ideal if it can come from parents, but I think even programs um, that try to expose women and young women, especially right. to like technology and the opportunities that are there and create that community early yes. is so important. I mean, Absolutely. our careers are our entire life, right? Mm -hmm. And no one wants to, no one's particularly jazzed to jump into a career where they know they're going to feel like an other every day of their lives. Absolutely. So, I was just talking to my son's elementary school. I volunteer for both STEAM and STEM there. And so I had a room full of girls and we were doing Girls Who Code. And I remember saying to them, I stopped them and I said, listen, do you guys ever feel like you can't speak up, you know, with a, you're, you're with a bunch of, you know, boys in your classroom, you're ew, and they're making all these comments. And I'm like, do you ever feel like you can't raise your hand and speak up because you just feel shy or I was trying to get to, across them imposter syndrome. And, you know, when we finally found their, they found their words to explain it. They said, yeah, because, you know, that boy says I'm stupid or, you know, that boy says, I don't know what I'm talking about. And this girl said, yeah, because that boy says, I don't know math because I'm a girl. And I said, well, what did you say to that? And she said, and she, she stood up very tall and she said, I told him I absolutely do know math. And I said, you know, one of the beautiful things that you may not see now, but I hope when you look back when you're older is by starting now to understand what is imposter syndrome? What is that voice that is going to, you know, be there probably a lot of your career telling you, you can't do something. I hope you remember when you sat up tall and said to that boy, I can do this in the third grade, because that's the beginning of a confidence that if we can mm -hmm. have women going into tech, you know, in this, this new generation that's to come, imagine what a cool workplace that would be without sort of the challenges that we've gone to. And I mean, I get goosebumps talking about it because, yeah. you know, it's just been such a hard journey, at least for me personally in data science side. Um, of where I've gone through. And so to hear the kids now thinking about this in, in STEM and STEAM programs that, that are girls, I was just, I was so inspired. Do you do any sort of activities like that yourself with, you know, girls who code or digi girls or volunteering mm -hmm. or even, you know, through the school systems yourself? Yeah. I mean, I think those are so important. I've, I've been part of our local planning committee for the digi girls event for several years oh, um, I at least that. until it had to go virtual, but um, yeah, right. you know, and I think like that was awesome. And we actually hosted a, an imposter syndrome session there too, to sort of get them planting that seed and thinking about it. Um, and it's amazing. What did they say when you are. did that? I, I'm very curious now, like, how was that when you did plant that seed with the Digi Girls? Um, I don't remember any like super impactful responses, like you mentioned, but I know they definitely are like, oh yeah, I don't know that. But then you also have like half the room that's just like so overconfident and, and I'm like, I wish I had that I confidence when I, I was like, here. It's like, or I even now. have that now. Like, I know, exactly. <laughs> I know. It's so funny. That's so true. In the class that I was teaching, it was either radio silence or this other side of the house where I'm like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they were, somebody said, I want to be a horse jumper. And I was like, okay, cool. And I'm like, there was a few rock stars. There was a cowboy wrangler. I'm like, what's a cowboy wrangler? Is that you wrangle the cowboys? And they were like, I don't know, just something in cow world. And it was such a, I was like, wow, when I went to school, there was a lot of doctors and lawyers and teachers. And, but like nowadays it's like kids know that they can really be anything. And, and I think that's one of yep. the cool things that, that they're and learning so that confidence. 
there's so many resources for them to learn about these opportunities, right? You're not limited to like, well, I go to the doctor and they seem kind of cool. So I guess I'll be a doctor. I mean, exactly. I've had responses where these girls are like, well, I want to be a cryptographer. I want to oh, work awesome. in like data security. And I'm like, I don't even like know those jobs existed. <laughs> Oh my gosh. When my son had me come present on being a data scientist, cause he had been writing, I want to be a data scientist at Microsoft when I grow up. And I'm like, do you even know what that is in kindergarten? Yeah. He was like, no. And so he had me come present to the class and I'm like, how am I going to make this interesting? So I, I spent all night, like I'm going to do it with the Xbox. And I got in there and the kids in the room were like, oh, don't you mean work with algorithms? And I was like, oh, okay. This is a <laughs> whole other level. Like my family stills eyes glass over when I say algorithm. And you're actually asking me that I was so impressed. Like, it's amazing. I mean, kids just nowadays, they instinctively understand, like mm -hmm. when I started talking about my world, they could make the parallel to, oh, on Xbox, when things are recommended to me, is that what you mean? I'm like, exactly that. And mm -hmm. it was just such a different world of talking about a role that I don't know, it, it got me thinking that what is it going to be next? Okay. So once we fix this, you know, women in tech and girls coming into code, you know, what do you foresee that maybe some of the challenges might evolve into as they, you know, we get more and more women into the workplace, or maybe there's none, maybe it's more about communities. Like you mentioned that you built when you were at your first job. Well, I mean, I think there's always going to be differences, right? I mean, even, you know, you were talking about dressing a certain way and I still, a lot of times would get things like that where it's, you know, I, I like wearing dresses and blazers and And, and your glasses and... are fabulous, by the way. <laughs> I hands down, I I have a, a secret obsession with glasses, so I pay attention Thank and you. those <laughs> might be at least my favorite for the last six months. I mean, those are, um, where did you get those? Those are amazing. Uh, I got them from Zilu. What's Zilu? Um, I don't know. It's an online it's like an company. Online and I found them because they were advertising like the kookiest glasses I'd ever seen. And I was like, <laughs> um, I love these. They fit so. you so well. Like I was just thinking, you know, the, the embodiment of what you're wearing right now is exactly what my boss at my first job told me that. And that's how I dress. And that's what I love. And she told mm -hmm. me, you need to stop wearing that. You need to stop being mm -hmm. trendy. Yep. But she also told me not to wear black because it's too sexy. So she told me to wear brown and she grilled it into my head where like, and she brought to work what looked like a potato sack. And I remember I took it home and I wore it and I was so uncomfortable and thus began years of feeling insecure in my own outfits because it's like, I kept hearing that voice in my head. And so one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is you don't have to keep all advice. Advice should be one of those things that can wash over you and inform, but you don't have to hold it like a Bible. And so, you know, if you could tell your former self or, you know, going back to maybe your younger self, any piece of advice about anything, what would you tell young Amanda? Um, oh, I was so naive. There's so many things. <laughs> um, no, I think it would probably be first and foremost, um, just to, to sort of, recognize and do your best to ignore that inner bully that, you know, we talked a little bit about imposter syndrome. Mm. And I, I don't think I knew what that was when I first started my career and when I was younger. Yeah. And so just sort of recognizing that. And then, I mean, it's always going to be there. You're never going to get rid of it. But I think if you can recognize it. That voice um, is always here with me. I'm like, Shh, yeah. Sh sh <laughs> and I think for me, it was it would be encouraging myself to speak up more. You know, I'm, I'm naturally a quiet person and I'm okay, that's my personality. But I think especially when I think about myself early in my career and when I was first starting off in university or my job, I was even quieter because it was thinking, well, I'm, I don't know as much, I'm just starting out. Like, I don't know, maybe this is how they do things. And now I recognize how important that fresh voice is to those Absolutely. things. That diversity of thought is so important because most of the time, if I'm willing to stand up and ask the like, quote unquote, stupid question, the answer is simply, well, I don't know, or that's how we've always done it. And that's there's right. probably a better way. And all it needed was someone to say, I don't understand why you're doing that. Or can you explain and that? being <laughs> brave enough to say that, because honestly, a lot of people don't want to say when they don't know something for fear right. that they're going to be judged as well, you know, so then they end up either talking a lot about nothing or not speaking up. And so yep. I, and I think so that was relevant. totally me when I was younger. And so that would be my encouragement to be like, no, that voice is important. Go ahead and use it.
No, I mean, if I could, you know, do a poll of, I think I've now had just shy of 90 guests on the podcast over the last year and a half. I would say a good 62. Oh, here's my precise number. 62%, not 69. (laughs) (laughs) 62.75. Exactly. We got to have decimal point precision. Have said the same thing, you know, just telling yourself, you know what, you have a valid opinion. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, I just had an Inspire hire, which for those of you who are not Microsoft, that's folks coming out of, of school that we bring in and help, you know, start their career essentially once they graduate. But she, she said to me, what do I have to add value to this meeting? I'm just an inspire hire. And I'm like, I like pump the brakes right there. Like, don't just discount who you are. You put that just in there and immediately I was gonna I say, saw her you need to later. eradicate just from your language <laughs> right now. <laughs> and it was so funny just saying that to her, I could see mm-hmm. a little bit of more like pride coming in. And I said, you know what I learned from what you said prior to that? And I told like, I recanted what she had said. And I'm like, no matter how many years of a career experience you have, whether you're Inspire Hire or whether you're the CEO, you learn from each other. There's reverse mentorship. There's the mentorship and you just learn. If you're not open to learning, then you shouldn't be in the position you are, period. Mm -hmm. And so do you do any mentorship like that with folks either at Microsoft, outside of Microsoft, helping them on their own career journey based on your learnings and knowledge? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I love to mentor people coming in, um, certainly to Microsoft, people that are looking to get into Microsoft, um, people I've met through different programs or formal mentoring things, um, you know, whether it be in like high school or college. Um, I've definitely worked with several folks that are looking to get into like MBA and maybe coming from a tech background or looking to get into tech. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think just whatever I can do to help them like see that community and see the value of of their voices is what I love. So, you know, I'll tell you this. So I had on the CEO of MXD yesterday and I asked her, um, do you mentor? She said, yes. And I said, what is the one piece of advice that you could tell me as a mentor to help me get better? Cause I'm like, you're a CEO, like you've hit the echelon. And she said, you know what? One of the greatest things I can say as a mentor myself is that I can't take on any more people, but you know what I can do for the next person who asks me and is brave enough to say, hey, Chandra, will you mentor me? And I have to say no, but I can say no, but go help find another mentor for them. And I was like that simple, like, you know, step that I hadn't even thought of myself, where if you can go then have the recommendation to then open the door and say, okay, they were brave enough to come ask me. And I unfortunately can't do it myself, but Hey, I'm pairing you with somebody that I recommend, you know, then that person who's taken that chance doesn't now suddenly feel like they don't want to ever ask anybody else because of the no, they now have another path. And I'm like, brilliant. It was just such a simple way, you know, to, to sort of take mentoring to the next level. And it was interesting as we were talking, I kept asking her, well, do you have imposter syndrome? You're a CEO. And she was like, you know, it's funny. I feel like you're putting me on a pedestal. And I was like, I guess I am a little, I'm, I'm a little fangirling here. And she's like, of course I have imposter syndrome. And I was just, I was profoundly blown away by her honesty. Would you think that in your experience in the workplace, that the more you're connected to your honesty and authenticity, the more it resonates with others, even when you have to say the hard truths of what's happening, or maybe you can't support them or do something in a project, but that the more authentically honest you are with them, the better it is for outcomes. Or do you fall in more of the sales side, not knocking it where you just sort of say what maybe they want to hear? Um, so I think by nature, I'm a people pleaser, Okay, so but am I. <laughs> not to the, not to the point where I want to just say what they want to hear. Yeah. I, I want to do it in an, in an honest and authentic way. Right. And so maybe that saying, I don't have the answer for you, exactly. but I will help you get it. Exactly. And, and I think that's sort of been what's worked for me, um, at, certainly in my most recent roles and career. Um, you know, we joked about coming in in that knowing Azure. And so there was certainly a time where I was ramping up on the technology and I wasn't the expert. I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And it was very often I was in meetings saying, well, I'm I'm not totally sure on that. Let me confirm. I don't want to give you the wrong answer. So let me go get that. And I had probably 20 different versions of saying, I don't know. But the reality Um, is I bet you, if you were to pull those customers that you earned their respect and because now they know you're willing to to go do that legwork, you're not just going to say any answer, but you're going to admit 
I don't know, but I'm going to find out for you. That mm-hmm. earns so much more respect, in my opinion, when somebody does that than somebody who does what I did in that first week that Tom sent me out to Tune SQL DB. And I told Linda, we have a woman on our team that was named Linda, and she was this amazing, amazing sort of DB dev tuner. She just knew everything about SQL. And I told her the story of Tom sending me out a week into the job to go tune some SQL. And I'm like, I'm a data scientist. Does not mean I can tune SQL, but sure, I'll try. And instead of saying, I don't know, I'll find out, I stumbled over my words. I'm like, well, you can do this and you can do that. And, and, and it was terrible. And, and the people that my customer who I had to work with all the time and only them, something we called pinned, like a year later said to me, do you remember when your first weekend this happened? And they, we, we sort of had a good laugh about how ridiculous I was. So I think you're absolutely right. The more you can just be sort of, nobody knows every answer, but you're going to build that trust with them by saying, I don't know, but I find out. And then, and then you have up. to actually find follow out. Follow up. Exactly. Yeah. You can't just say it because that's the other thing people do all the time. They'll say they follow up and then it goes into a vacuum of nothingness. So I mm-hmm. absolutely, you're right on that. <laughs> So let me just pivot this to, okay, so I have a lot of listeners that are early in career as well as really established in career, covering a gamut of of careers. But for somebody who says, you know, I'm 40, I can't switch careers now. Would you disagree with that statement? Do you think there's never really a limit to your age in terms of learning and trying out new things? Uh, Absolutely. And I answer this question on Quora all the time. Oh, do you? (laughs) Because, well, so I didn't go back to get my graduate degree until I was in my 30s. And so, and I made a pretty big shift to cloud from hardware. Um, you know, I mean, it was still within tech, but I, I had no career background and knowledge to really support me in that. Right. Um, but that doesn't matter, right? Like you might make a few sacrifices in, in how quickly you're able to climb the ladder or whatever, but if it's going to be something that's going to, you know, be a rewarding career for you and it's what you want to do, go for it. Like, no, I'm you're never, never going to regret that decision to do something you enjoy. Have you ever taken, so in your career, um, were those the two primary jobs that you've had was the first one we've talked about and then at Microsoft, or did you have any other sort of small deviations along the way of trying things out? Um, those are really kind of the big two steps. It was kind of before and after grad school. Um, I did an internship while I was in grad school with Intel in their strategic planning org, because I kind of wanted to try okay. that out, um, which Thoughts? was which was interesting, but okay. but I ended up not yet. taking that direction. But um, okay. yeah, I, I think like that was the value for me in grad school was having that like dedicated two years to sort of talk to different people, try different things, and have that exposure to things that I maybe didn't realize I could try before. And would you say to somebody who's thinking about grad school, that grad school was well worth the time, commitment and money that you went through? Or would you say now that you've been in your career that, you know, grad school, it wasn't because I've had some really interesting answers from people on that question. For, for me, it was, um, but I didn't make the decision lightly. I, I ran all the numbers. I gave all the thought to what I wanted to do. Um, and I, and I get asked this question a lot too, when people are thinking, especially about the MBA in particular, it's like, well, well, what do you want to do? And now there's so much more flexibility too, to be able to do part-time things. Um, if you're, you know, older in your career to be able to do like executive programs and things like that. So there's so much more flexibility to maybe achieve that in parallel to what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but for me, it certainly was. Um, but like I said, I didn't, I didn't make that decision lightly. So no, I think it's also a really interesting one because I think an MBA may be different than some other master's programs. I think there is such tremendous value in, and I don't know that I don't have an MBA. Mine was in more of a master's side, but you know, would you say that to, to help align you for what career was going to really be like in the enterprise? And I use the example of like an MSR research PhD versus a PhD who's now been practically building stuff for customers. Those are two very different vantage points of a PhD, very valid in the right, but it's going to take two different types of people typically for those roles. Would you say that in your MBA it really enabled you to be able to step into more of a business role successfully coming out of school or did it enable you to do that specifically? Um, I think it both enabled me just in knowledge and preparation and confidence that I know how to do certain things and I understand why certain business decisions are being made. I think it also enabled me in that it actually gave me exposure to this. I, you know, I came into Microsoft through university recruiting. I'm pretty sure. 
Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that my resume popping up for a cloud solution architect role would have been completely ignored before. Um, but I had the advantage of coming in through this MBA recruiting process, having additional contacts, um, being exposed to alumni who were working this kind of job and um, could get me contacts and things like that, that I maybe wouldn't have had before. That networking piece is another thing that comes up quite often. Um, so would you agree then that having that network and honing and cultivating starting from school is something that then becomes very valuable when you're calling on it, looking for a job when you graduate? Is that something that it sounds like in your experience that your alumni, that, that side of the house became important to helping you land what you wanted to do? Yeah, I mean, I think... There's, there's a reason people say network, 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 and it's, it's all about the network. Um, but I think the caveat I would make to that is it's important to make sure that you're doing so from a genuine point of view. I've met a lot of people that are tackling building their network, and they're doing it just to gather business cards, gather names, and be able to call on them for help. But they haven't established a relationship making that person want to help them. That's um, so and valid. so I think... You want to build your network in a very thoughtful, strategic way with people that you maybe naturally connect with, that um, want to help you, um, and make sure that you're giving something back to them. Right. Um, you, know, you know, we talked about diversity of thought. Maybe you can give them ideas. There's things you can kind of reverse mentor. Um, there's, there's so much opportunity, but I think just generally staying genuine in how you're networking is really important. And so for those of you who don't know, like what, they're wondering what reverse mentorship is. It's where, you know, as a mentor, you know, and you have a mentee, they learn a lot from you and you're like, great. Well, in return, we as the mentors learn a ton from the scenarios and stuff that a mentee is going through. And that is reverse mentorship. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think is actually more powerful? The, the mentorship. So I'm learning, I'm hungry, I'm here, I'm learning. Or the reverse mentorship of what you gain from the mentee you work with. Um. I'll say reverse mentoring just because I don't think it happens enough and I don't think we put enough value on it. Um, I've even be been put in reverse mentoring situations where they treat it like a mentoring situation. And so they don't like fully grasp the value of, of pausing and listening because they're so used to being in that position of giving advice. And I love their advice. I will gladly take it. Um, but there's, there's a value in making sure that you're you're listening to what's happening. Um, and there's things that, you know, you talk to someone in a VP level or a C-suite, you know, they have the power to change things that somebody else like myself, maybe, you know, in an individual contributor role doesn't have, but they're probably just not even aware it's happening. And so those reverse mentoring opportunities inform them of what's going on and, and what people are experiencing. No, I think that's very valid, Amanda. I, you know, one of the things that I love about you is you are very fresh and honest when I ask questions. And, and I, you know, while we never got to work together, you know, and Shannon and I, so Shannon is one of the biggest supporters of this podcast and, and one of my, my greatest friends, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Chicago with her and her wife. And we talk a lot about you, you know, and we talk a lot about those on the team that were, you know, just so amazing to supporting us as, as people, as careers and people that we want to help then. And I think to the point of the network, you know, a network is there not just for you to, to get and take from, but also to provide and give and, and having that two way street and symbiosis is really what builds and forges, not just a network, but then friendships that come out of it. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I want to leave the podcast with one thing. I know we both won gold club. Are you, did you take the cash or are you going on the trip? I, I took the cash, not going on the trip this year. I just didn't know what was happening <laughs> with, uh, with the it's pandemic. Okay. It, it felt dicey. No, fair enough. I am, um, I'm a, I have to admit, I'm a bit, I'm a bit bummed because I'm, I am taking the trip and I was hoping you were going to be there, but I will, <laughs> I will think of you in spirit and congratulations you in winning it. Please. I think that's fantastic. And thank you listeners for listening and dialing into the show today. Um, just Amanda is one of these people that I think you should reach out to on LinkedIn or Twitter and ask questions because she will literally respond to everybody that I've seen that asks of her. Um, and so don't bombard her with stuff, but look at her as a resource that if you have questions about getting into Microsoft or our fields, and I'm volunteering you, by the way, just my totally perception fine. as a host <laughs> is that she's one of those more open people that will give you honest and, and helpful feedback. And so thank you again, Amanda, for being on the show today. And um, I look forward to hopefully working together together again one day soon.
Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. Loved what you've heard on this week's episode? Well, the answer is simple. It would mean the world to us if you could head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review and feedback. Spreading the word really is the best way to grow our podcast and it's done it even more efficiently. Loved what you've heard on this week's episode? Well, well, the answer is simple. It would mean the world to us if you could head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star review and feedback. Spreading the word really is the best way to grow our podcast and achieve even greater things. Thank you. Thank you.